happening on Wall Street. Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. How are you doing there? Happy St. Patrick's Day. It is probably one of the most unusual St. Patrick's Day we've ever experienced. It's David. It's the podcast. We're trying to make sense of stuff, particularly economics, but well, the world has changed so profoundly after the last while that uh, I'm here with your man. How are you, Head? Very good. I'm glad well, you're f- I, I don't know if I'm very good. I'm glad you're about five <laughs> yards away from me. Do not come any closer. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually sick of the sight of you now that you could be viral, you know? Oh, I'm moving in here. Listen, exactly. Uh, strange, strange times, John. I have never, ever had this feeling, this weird feeling of an impending, it's kind of an anxiety, it's an impending fear that something yeah. awful is about to happen. Yeah, it is bizarre. And when they announced the, on Thursday last the closing of schools and and everything. I went around to my supermarket and it was absolutely jammers. It was worse than a really, really busy Christmas Eve. And it was funny because there was a a kind of a cross between a little bit of anxiety, as as you say, but also there was a there was almost a hint of festivities about the yeah, whole thing. Like this is speedrun. But I think that's all changed. I think I think if I you think look so, at yeah. if you look at Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Every single hour, the sense that we need to isolate ourselves, we need to... The best piece of advice I saw was on Twitter, a guy, a a professor saying, look, the best way to behave now is behave as if you have it. So behave as if you have it. So what would you do if you got tested today and it was positive? How would you behave towards your neighbours, towards your friends, towards your family? And that's the way in which our own personal behavior is now the best weapon against this greater yeah. threat. And that's very, very difficult, but my, my sense is that people will do it. Well, I have to say, I, I'm, I don't know if proud is the right word, but I'm impressed at the way I think Ireland has handled it. I think we've moved quickly when we need to move quickly. We have all come together. But what's impressed me most is actually the schools. Uh, yeah, that's unusual. Come from you. you yeah, never, it is actually. By the way, I have never heard John speaking of. John's I have never heard John once say that schools were impressive in any way. In fact, he was the greatest mitcher of all time. The, the best, the best school mitcher I have ever come across was Mr. John Davis in the early to mid eighties. Nary a week went by before this man was coming down with something atrocious. Anyway. Uh, Emma, my daughter, well, all the, the girls, all my girls are off school, but Emma, my daughter, goes to St. Raphael's. And on Friday, she had a full day's school online. Teacher logged in. Teacher sent them all a link to Zoom, a Zoom session. Wow. They all jumped in and, you know, they're asking questions and stuff, which is amazing. But <laughs> did you hear about what they did in China, in Wuhan? No. This bunch of teachers got together. Brilliantly, you know, you know, people come up with, with great solutions in, when they're faced with a challenge. And they put together this app, I think it was called Ding Talk or something like that. And they used it to put together online lessons for school kids. And they got the app, they put it up in the uh, Apple Store and all the kids downloaded it and they were being given homework and all the rest. But in all their smartness, the one thing that they didn't realise was that and the kids did realize that if you give an app a really poor rating, Apple automatically takes it off the Apple store. I love it. I love <laughs> so it. all the kids gave it a one star rating. It really and it disappeared. <laughs> it disappeared. That's great. That is great. <laughs> but no, so look, we're in we're in lockdown in Ireland now. It will become more dramatic. I've no doubt. I don't think anything has ever happened in my lifetime. Mm. You know, I'm talking about as an economist, looking at the way the world works, looking where the economy works. Nothing has happened in my lifetime that will have as profound an impact on the way we go about our lives. And I think we're at a moment where politics is going to change, economics is going to change, sociology is going to change. And underpinning that, John, is the notion of fragility. So for so long, all of us walk around the world thinking, you know what, the system is permanent. 
I get up, I go to work, I do my thing. The latitude for change is there, but it's up to me to change things. Mm. This, I think, reinforces for the first time, again, in our lifetime, just how fragile we are in the face of nature, of a health scare, the way in which we deal with the economy, the way in which we build houses, all these sort of things. So I think we're we're looking at the most profound change in the way in which we look at the world that we've ever seen. It's always quite good to have experts. I know your man over in the UK, what's his name? Gove. Oh, yeah. Doesn't like an expert. But yeah. I like an expert. Yeah. And we had Luke on. Remember Luke O'Neill? Luke was great. He was on a couple of weeks ago. He's, I believe he's over in Tanzania now at the moment doing a gig. You, you were talking to him there a few minutes ago? He's doing a charity gig uh, a, for cancer care for kids. And they bring over lots and lots of medical instruments to Tanzania. I presume it was a gig booked years ago. Yeah. Uh, he's there now and he's on the line. Luke, Dar es Salaam, that's a strange one before we, 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 we talk about the virus. How you? I know, David. It's a bit unusual, isn't it? Yeah, so we came here on Friday to do a big benefit gig. My band, The Metabolics, we're a bunch of amateurs, but we enjoy ourselves. We're a big cancer charity, a children's cancer charity here. And we raised loads of money for them. And then we had to bring all these supplies. So we brought chemo and syringes. and that. There's a woman here called Trish Scanlon. She runs a thing called Their Lives Matter. So we had to come and do the gig, you know, just to raise money. To the renowned sound of Metabolics. It's a, That's a great absolutely. name, isn't it? That's a brilliant name. Absolutely. <laughs> Luke, so tell me, tell me, tell me, uh, just first very briefly from, from Tanzania. Yeah. Is there COVID down there? No, there's none here now. I mean, Tanzania is not bad. Is it? one of the? It's got reasonable health service. It's not brilliant, of course, but it's not bad. They're testing widely. There isn't any COVID here. It's one of the few countries but there's yet to be a positive case. And they think, David, it's partly it's so humid here. Like, it's really humid. It's 98% humid. And you walk outside, you're, wow. you're sweating buckets, you know. And they reckon that might be killing the virus, possibly, you know. It should, it should be here, really, because there's lots of, lots of Chinese come here. It's a Zanzibar, for example. And lots of Italians come here for the last couple of months. And the government didn't stop them traveling, you know. So it should be here, really, but they can't detect it. So that might be a hopeful thing for us, because maybe in the summer now, you know, in Ireland and Europe, we'll see it die off a bit. So that's one good aspect, I guess. Okay, Luke, let's just come back to, to, to Ireland right now. Where do you think this is going to go? Do you think we should be in more lockdown? I mean, there's been a lot of talk over the last couple of days, pubs being open, etc. people still out. What's your sense? Yeah. At the moment in Ireland, as far as I can make out, um, it's voluntary, isn't it? You're, you're, people are being told to stay home and not yeah. go to the restaurant or whatever. But the next step will be to enforce that because of the lack of compliance and the whole debate, David, and this has happened four times in the 20th century, by the way. We've had similar epidemics of Ebola in Africa, for instance, you know. Will people behave themselves is the question. And sadly, human nature being what it is, the guy sneaks out for a crafty cigarette out the back or whatever, you know, he goes down to the pub if it's open or whatever, you know. So people don't necessarily follow the rules, you see. Now, in that situation, you enforce it. And that means getting, the sadly, the guards and the army on the streets and making sure people stay in. That sounds very like the science fiction horror scenario but that has to be the next step because if this continues david the, the medical services are frightened now you see for good reason they're on the front line remember one in five doctors in italy is now sick you know with this virus for instance and the nurses get sick as well you see so they're, they're, they're saying well hang on a minute you know we're getting sick our equipment isn't good enough because there's too many people coming in as in italy i'm talking about now you have to do something you know when they start to say you gotta listen you know and the Irish medical circus are saying the exact same thing because they're, they're the ones on the front line. They want to save people, you know, and rescue them. And they, and, they, and they feel they can't do it. So they're going to really bang the drum and say, hang on a minute, something more draconian is needed here. So I suspect a lack of compliance will mean enforcement. That has to be the direction we're heading. Now, Luke, will you explain to me the United Kingdom's approach to this, the UK's so-called herd immunity? Can you do two things for me, Luke? Explain to me, yeah. one, our policy and what it's predicated on in terms of immunology, and yeah. explain their policy and what it's predicated on in terms of immunology. Yeah, well, first of all, David, I know Patrick Balance quite well. He is the chief scientific advisor of the government. He was the head of research in GlaxoSmithKline. He's a very sensible, measured scientist. He's very impressive, right? So he, they've decided, as you know, not to have a full sort of response to this and wait. That's their policy. And what they mean by waiting is there aren't sufficient cases at the moment. They're projecting a big spike in about three or four weeks. If you lock people down now, they're saying, they'll get fidgety, you know, and they'll start to, the, the, the compliance level goes down. That's their worry. And suddenly when it's peaking, then people are sneaking out of their houses. 
They aren't observing social distancing. And that's why they've delayed this. That's their justification, you see. Now, that's his opinion, right? So, so Luke, can, you just, we, can I just stop you there? It's, so it's yeah. more of a judgment call about people's personal behaviour and psychology than actually a systemic view of what's the best way to go. Absolutely. It's absolutely about human behaviour. That's the main motivation behind the British government's approach to this, because they don't trust their own people, maybe partly. But secondly, they do feel that, you know, I don't know it's a strange one, isn't it? You know? It is so, a strange one. But, but then, now he could be right, because, because if you delay it a bit, but delay the lockdown, and then when it's really bad, then you lock everybody down, and then they come all compliant, and then, then the thing begins to go. The second idea is this herd immunity, David. There's a rumour they've let it run a bit to infect people, you see, because once you get 60% or so infected, they begin to build up resistance, right? And that's the kind of number that means there's not much place for the virus to hide anymore. You know, so the more people who have the virus and then fight it, they're in our resistance, you see, and there's nowhere for the virus. The virus can't reinfect them. So therefore, you get, get a certain level of people who are now not, not going to get infected anymore, and the virus has nowhere to hide. And therefore, you see herd immunity. And that's, now, now they've denied that, David. They said that wasn't the case, okay? That's a very serious thing to, to do because you're going to kill people if you look for that. Because you're letting the virus run free, the vulnerable yeah. people will be the ones who will die, you know? And it's almost as if, and I wouldn't say a cynical act to go for that, but that, that's, I guess that's why they're denying it, it partly. But it's, it, a risk, it's a risky thing to say, you know? It almost feels like a cold, that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a strange one. They've denied that they're going for that, uh, and we have to believe them, I suppose, you know? But by God, they're taking a gamble here, David. I mean, it's outrageous, David, that on the island of Ireland, there's two different policies. That's completely stupid, you know? Both, it's for one island, for God's sake. The virus doesn't respect borders, does it? You know, we should have one policy for the whole of Ireland and, and, the, and the north should follow the south. Well, well the, I think what, the north, again, and of course, it's, it's split down on, on orange versus green lines, which is, again, yeah, yeah. totally, doesn't totally help, pathetic. Doesn't, doesn't help. But, but, politics, politics can kill people with these epidemics. This has been shown in the past, over the past 50, 60 years. If you play politics with this, you see people die, you know. And the British government are now exposed as the only government in, in the world to follow this policy, by the way. They're certainly, you know, confident that this might work for them. And it's a big experiment. And let's hope it works, because if it doesn't, there's a projection in the UK, David, if they got it wrong, nearly 300,000 people will die there if they got it wrong. That's how big, that's how high the wow. stakes are here, you know. So we're going to wait and see now. now. Now, as I say, Valence isn't stupid, you know. And he would have talked to all the world experts. He would have done all the modelling and the algorithms and all that kind of thing. So there's some basis for what he's advising there, you see. So, and I hope for his sake, he's got it right. Now, let's, let's come back uh, t- to Ireland in terms of the next stages. What are the next stages? First of all, you've talked about personal responsibility. You've talked about in the event that's not the case, we actually impose that. Then what happens? Yeah. Well, you've got to keep banging the drum, David, constantly. It's a very simple mantra now, right? Stay home. Keep the hygiene up, you know, that's the second most important thing of all, very importantly. Those are the two key things you can do, really, you know. And then just wait it out. I mean, that, and, and the two-meter rule is very, very important. If everybody in Ireland did that nowadays, if, if everybody agreed with this, and they do stay in their houses, now they might go out once a day, that's fine. A little bit of exercise is good, a bit of sunshine. It's okay to do a bit of shopping. And stay two meters from everybody, very important, right? That's the key thing there as well. We may it'll slow this down for definite. That's for definite now. But everybody has to comply because, again, you're looking at tens of thousands of people dying in an overworked health service. That's all the projections from Italy. See, Italy's like a big experiment, David. We're, we're looking at Italy very, very closely as to what can happen to us, you know? And it's not great. You know what I mean? So, so that, that's the vista unless something happens along the lines I've just said. And Luke, when you look back home, you look at the health service, you look at the front line, you know, again, you've, you've mentioned it a couple of minutes ago. I've been quite shocked by the extent to which friends of mine who are medics are nervous, much more yeah. so than I've ever heard them before, much more so than maybe they even want to suggest themselves. But every single frontline doctor I have spoken yeah. to, our radiographer, radiologist, anybody who's working in the service, nurses, whatever, they seem to be terrified. They are. They are. And that's that's obviously a concern for the rest of us, isn't it? And I've got a couple of very good medical friends and uh I was with them on Friday night, on Thursday night, and yeah, they were. I th- said th- th- the main reason they're well, one reason they're frightened is the news out of Italy is bad. We're blessed in Ireland with a fantastic set of people in medicine, even though they get knocked all the time. These guys are, and women are stepping up now, big time, you know. And they want to make they want to make it real. They want to make sure they can do the best job they can. And they're looking at the numbers around the world. 
And they're going, oh no, there's a, there's a storm coming here and I'm frightened, you know. And of course, it doesn't inspire us which, when you hear that they're a bit scared. And then it's the HSE's job to, to help them, I suppose, you know. So we're going to see, we're going to see, I think, um, a bit more of that in the next few weeks, potentially. And let's hope the HSE responds adequately, really, to help them. Luke, can I ask you, given that we don't have a cure or a vaccine as yet, what is the treatment for yeah, someone yeah. who, who contracts it? You know, it, do yeah. they actually need to go to hospital? Well, they do if it's severe. Now, as we know, remember, everybody should remember 80% are fine. So four to five people have a mild disease. Many of those, actually, it's extremely mild. They have a day of aches and pains, then they get over it. 80%. That's a great number to keep your head on because if it was, if it was less than that, we'd really be terrified. Yeah. So the 20% the twenty who are left over, 14 to 15% will have a more severe course. And what that means is their lungs begin to fail. They have trouble breathing. That's the key serious symptom, right? And now we're in trouble. You've got to get to a hospital or maybe you're in one already. And the first thing that puts you on a ventilator, which is a machine to help you breathe, it gets the lungs full of air and it saves people's lives. I mean, the importance of ventilators cannot be overemphasized. You put people on a ventilator and now they can breathe normally and you can keep them on ventilators for days. You know, it's great. Now, they also give them steroids to suppress the inflammation because what's happening is the lungs are becoming very irritated. The main reason being the virus has got a foothold and it's growing like crazy. And that really irritates the immune system, which now begins to really sort of damage the lungs, you see. So, so the big move now is to give anti-inflammatories at that stage, very importantly, only at the severe stage. Right. The trouble is, if, if you give anti-inflammatories early, it increases the risk of infection because you're lowering the immune system, you know? So it's a nuanced thing. You've got to be careful when you give these drugs. You can't give them too soon because then the immune system doesn't work at all. The virus gets a foothold, you know? So it's tricky. But when they're in that severe phase, you can give them these anti-inflammatories not to help them as well. And if you're lucky, they'll get over it. Now, the trouble is, 3 4 5% die. You can't stop it. It's relentless, you know? Right. Now, at the moment, that's probably around 1% overall. It's not quite as high as we thought. And then there's the different groups of higher risk of dying, as we know, the older people and, and so on. So it's a well-characterized uh, pro- progression, I guess, in many ways. Now, the great news is, John, as you may have seen, I sent a tweet out on this yesterday. The great news is two anti-inflammatory drugs are working really well. One blocks a protein in the immune system called IL-6. You can't beat these terrible names, but that's what they are. And I, and I worked on IL-6 for 30 years. 30 years ago, I worked on IL-6. And I was in that market. And IL-6 is a very irritating protein. It causes arthritis in your joints, amazingly, and really makes inflammation go crazy in your joints and beats up the joint therapy, right? The exact same proteins that are damaging these people's lungs and causing inflammation in there. You know what I mean? So in other words... The inflammatory process is the same as arthritis. It's just a different tissue becoming inflamed. And there's a drug in Ireland approved for arthritis called Actemra that blocks IL-6. And lo and behold, the Chinese and the Italians now, there's at least 50 people now I'm looking at. They haven't published this yet, so you've got to be careful. It's been anecdotal, you know. But the word on the web is, it's working. This is saving people's lives. And that's fantastic now because now we have something to give people and they won't die. You know, those ones on the ventilators and so on won't die. The second drug is called hydroxychloroquine. That's used for malaria, and the Chinese found that was effective, right? There are 22 separate trials running in China at the moment, proper placebo-controlled trials running on on hydroxychloroquine, and that's showing promise as well. Now, I'm fully confident, and I can say this uh, without any fear of criticism, this is going to work, and it's going to stop people dying. And the only question now is how quick can we get it into our hospitals, you know? Now, it'll take a month or so to confirm all that data, but once it happens, the doctors will have another weapon now to use to stop people dying of respiratory failure, which is great, you know. And is there a big enough... Sir, I was going to say, is there a big enough supply of these drugs at the moment? That's great. There's there's a number of questions now, and looking, I'm on this COVID-19 expert panel. That's the exact question. Can we make enough? Can we get it into Ireland in enough quantities? What about people? Some people really need the drug for their arthritis. Well, they run out of it, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. Luke, Luke, and then then who's going to pay pay for it? Can I stop you there, Luke? Ireland, Ireland has got arguably the biggest pharmaceutical industry per head of population anywhere in the world in terms of production. Yeah. Do we make this stuff in Ireland? Do you know, we, sadly, we, I don't think we make this specific one. Of all things, wouldn't you know it, Dave? We don't make... Roche is a drug company that make it, right? I don't think that this one isn't, isn't made in Ireland. But that doesn't really matter. It's made, I think, in the US and also maybe in India in huge amounts. And there's lot, I wonder how much stock the HSE have. They may have lots. But there's a second drug, David, which is a similar one made by a company called Regeneron, and they're making that in the Dell factory in Limerick. So there is one being made in Ireland. 
There's a third drug that's called a biosimilar, which is much cheaper, that blocks the same thing again. See, drug companies often have competing products against the same thing, you know. So there's yes. three drugs on the market. There's three drugs on the market that block IL-6. All three will show efficacy in this disease. But that, it's a big question about supply. That, that's a key question at the moment. Hydroxychloroquine is available in mass amounts. You can make it. It's a chemist, chemical. It's much easier to get. So that may be the first one that's going to be used over the other one, you know. So you, at least you have two options now, I suppose. So you never know. One might be preferred over the other. So, so as I say, I'm optimistic now that these two drugs will be available, which is great. Great stuff, Luke. Listen, we will talk to you when you get back. That was uh, that was excellent. And enjoy Brilliant. the uh, enjoy Tanzania, and we'll see you back home. Thanks, David. When are you Thanks, playing John. next? When, yeah, when yeah. are metabolics playing yeah. next? In about six years, low. by the I'm, looks of things. I'm, I'm going to lie low for a while, lad. It's a bit, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. All right. You can't, you can't, anyway, you can't do gig, David. I mean, all the gigs are bad, you know, in Dublin. Tell me about them. I've got a couple of professional musicians with me here, and they're devastated. All their gigs are cancelled for the next two months, and, and there's no money, you know, so there's no gigs anymore, sadly. But let's hope that changes. Fair enough, Luke. Listen, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for that. Great. Thanks, Thanks, guys. All Cheers. Right. All the best. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Jeez, scary times, Mac. Yeah, John. I mean, again, scary times if you sit back and think there's nothing we can do. The way I look at it is that there's two forms of human suffering which are associated with this virus. One is the human suffering that we're all going to feel in terms of our health and the health of our loved ones, yeah. particularly particularly our, our, our parents, our, our mothers, our, our elderly mothers, and anybody who's frail and fragile. And the health service, hopefully, and the medical service can deal with that. There's another part of human suffering, which is going to be the economic fallout on people's lives. It's going to be enormous. The recession that's coming has profound impacts. We know for a fact that there is a correlation between economic well-being and health, mental health in particular. So if you lose your job, if you lose your house, if you're going to bed every night feeling anxiety about money, this has a profound effect on your mental and physical health. Yeah. So it's really incumbent on economics to figure out, can we fix a bit of this, minimize the hurt, minimize the dislocation? Can we imagine a different type of economy to right at the moment make sure that the recession is shallower than it has to be or than it would otherwise be? Mm. Now, what? But you're talking, me, you're talking here uh, something bigger than... The Fed, for instance, dropping in interest rates. Much bigger than that, right? Yeah, okay. But I am talking about central banks. Okay, I'm talking about, you know, me. So what really annoyed me this week uh, was Christine Lagarde, who I would say is the biggest fraud in public life. Really? Yeah, she, this is a wow. woman who knows nothing. That's about, fight and talk. No, John, it's, you know, I've watched her as finance minister of, of, of France. I've watched her as head of the IMF. I've watched her now as head of the ECB. This woman, in economic terms, is right. a fraud. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She's a trained lawyer, which automatically is a red flag to everybody. Jesus, I thought she was an economist. No, she's not. She's a lawyer. Oh, my God. Okay, she's right. She was a partner at Baker McKinsey, a big law firm, right? So that's where she's from. Good operator, French, you know, works the system very well. Not saying she's not an impressive person, mm. but as an economic mind, she is junior cert level in terms of sophistication, even less, right? Jesus Christ. Well, that's what happens. If you yeah. notice, that's what happens. These sort of people get promoted in big institutions because yeah. it's all politics. They can play the game, yeah. All that thing. yeah. She said the other day to the Italians, right? Now, you just heard what Luke talked about the Italians. We now mm. know what's happening in Italy. She said it is not the job of the ECB to worry about the bond spreads of Italian long-term debt. Now, that basically... What, what it means is basically what happens is when, when Italy is under stress, the economy has collapsed health servants under stress. The Italians will need to borrow a lot of money yeah. in order to fix this. She's saying it's not the ECB's job to make that Italian effort any easier, right? When in actual fact, it is the Jesus, ECB. Jesus, I would have thought it is. It, that yeah. is, you know, right? Yeah. So again, it, it, it goes to the root of not being able to see the totality of the picture. The totality of the picture is that all economic policy worldwide has to be now focused on making sure that a health panic, which has led to a financial markets panic we've seen in the last week, mm -hmm. doesn't lead to a monetary panic in the economy at large, which will exacerbate the original downturn. 
And the, re- the way this happens is the following. This is why Lagarde seems to me to be a totally inappropriate person. In fact, you know, everyone's focusing on Bar- Boris Johnson, mm. right? My sense is, you know, Lagarde's understanding of monetary economics is a bit like Boris Johnson's understanding of immunology. <laughs> right? Okay, right. So yeah. let's go to it, right? <laughs> the panic sets in. The way these things work is on. We know, right? Because the two of us are working in the gig economy, right? Yeah. So we do our gigs, we get paid, those gigs have stopped. So suddenly, yeah, they hundreds of thousands, millions of people have a cash flow problem. There was cash you were banking on to come in, that has stopped. Once you have a cash flow problem, people don't understand is really good businesses go bust without cash. So you can have the best business in the world, but if you have no cash, you run out of cash, you go bust. Yeah. The first thing. The reason you run out of cash is you, you as a supplier doesn't get paid, then you can't pay somebody else, then suddenly the system begins to grind to a halt. Second thing is then the natural human instinct when you fear that cash is running out is you hoard, you panic. So it's the same instinct that had the people in the supermarket last Thursday buying up all the supplies, they're hoarding. Hoarding is a human instinct that happens when you're under threat. Yeah. So we hoard cash. So businesses with cash will delay payments for others. So suddenly a credit crunch associated with the slump in business prompts people to hoard. The hoarding then exacerbates the credit crunch and the system dries up for want of cash. And then very, very good businesses go bad because of this temporary cash flow problem. So the question is, what do you do about it? Yeah. At the moment, you're hearing all these things. Oh, we'll delay VAT and the government, you know, all these circuitous things. Yeah, right? are they not, they, they seem kind of logical to me, are they not? They're logical, but they're cumbersome, right? Okay. The best way to do this is to do what the Hong Kong gov- government did in early February. Hong Kong government gave free money to everybody. In economics, it's called helicopter money. <laughs> that basically okay. the central bank just credits everyone's account with X amount. The Hong Kongers gave about 1,500 euros to everybody. Okay, we could do more, we could do less, right? Sorry, is that per month or just a one-off? It's a one-off payment. The idea would be that if the source of the panic is you believe that I can't pay and I believe that you can't pay, the way in which you reassure people that you have money and I have money is the state just gives you money. The central bank simply prints it and puts it into your account. Where do they get the money? The great thing is the central bank print money. One of the great alchemies of central banking, and I speak as a former central banker, they are the most powerful institutions if led by the right people. Because at the very core is this great myth in economics that you can't just print money. You can. And at the root of this is Milton Friedman's argument. You know, Milton Friedman, tricky enough character, tricky enough character, if you're politically left, you very much associate him with the Chicago boys, the... Who are the Chicago boys? Well, Naomi, do you know Naomi Klein, an American... Yes, yeah, the author, yeah. She wrote a great book called The Shock Doctrine, which is about shock economics that basically monetarists, people who believe in monetarism and right-wing people, have this ideology, and you see it through Latin America in the 1980s, that you go in and you have the, the short, sharp shock idea. And this was the idea you kind of cleanse the system. It comes from a Chicago mm. economics. Largely, they were disciples of Milton Friedman. So there are many things that Friedman said which were not particularly interesting and not particularly persuasive in my mind. Right. But one or two of the things he said were was the following. If inflation is very low. If you are hit by a deflationary shock like this one, where prices will fall, demand will fall, the way you respond to it is you just print money and you give it to people. And as long as inflation is low and inflation isn't rising, you can print as much as you want. So the target is not the amount of money in the economy, but the rate of inflation in the economy. And if the rate of inflation is very low, and if your problem is that people need to be reassured about the amount of cash in your balance sheet and mm. my balance sheet and mm. everybody around's balance sheet? You simply print the money. So this is like this is like QE for the punter. Precisely. So QE was a money printing operation that used at its as its middleman the banking system. Right. So the Q 
central bank gifted money to the banks and in the in return, the bank said, we'll lend it out to people who want it. But that, again, is very cumbersome. It's two or three iterations. Mm. This way, you just give people money. Now, of course, one of the problems with something like this is it sounds too easy, right? Yeah. There's, I have a load of questions on this, how it would actually work. So I'll just come back, right? Mm. Basically, what has happened in economics over the last 30 or 40 years has been the tyranny of accountants. Right? God bless the accountant, right? For Al. The accountants, yeah, you're made Al, right? So accountants believe in this thing called double entry bookkeeping, which is, means that on a balance sheet, every credit has to have a corresponding debit. Yeah. So every asset, liability, every credit, sure. debit, right? Okay. Sure. And that's how the balance sheet balances, right? Mm. The economy doesn't have a balance sheet at all. There is nothing in Ireland. There's no balance sheet in the end of Ireland that means that Ireland has to balance or Europe has to balance or America has to balance. budgets always had to balance. They don't have to balance. This is the whole thing. This is the idea. Basically, what you have is you've got the tyranny of bad accountancy infesting economics. This is the only way of inoculating the economy against panic, which is injecting this money into the system. Okay? So mm. if you look at it in the same way as a health panic, the, this is the only known vaccine to a monetary panic. Accountants don't like it because it doesn't seem to make sense if you believe in double entry bookkeeping. Yeah. But because double entry bookkeeping has got nothing to do with economics, what you've got to do is realize that the central bank, which it did in QE, can mm. just simply print the money. And the question then is, should you print the money and give it to people? Or should you print the money and give it to the banks in order for the banks to charge interest to the same people you want to spend the money? <laughs> which is the crazy thing about right, QE, right? right? So it strikes me that worldwide now, we have got to realize we have got a global pandemic. We have a global slowdown. We have an oncoming recession. We have total lockdown. All of this will lead to a meltdown of the economic system unless the central bank steps up and says, we will ensure that there is enough money around so that you don't hoard money because you don't expect there not to be money there tomorrow or the next day. Okay, hang on a second. I, I have a couple of questions here. One is, it's kind of the logistics of doing that. So I, I kind of, I'm, I'm getting the, the idea of this. But number one, who gets the money? Everyone. Yeah, but when you say everyone, like, is that everyone from every child in the house? Everyone who has a bank account? What about the people who don't have everyone bank accounts? Everyone has a bank account. No, I'm assuming that most people have bank accounts. Right, because that's the real, that's the real Irish thing. Well, what about the fellow who doesn't have a bank account? Yeah. Let's think about it, right? Let's think about the, the big thing, right? Every citizen gets X amount of money, right? Right. What that does... So a family of six, like it, in our house, we get six grand, for instance. You might get six grand. You get four. But, yeah, you might get four. But the point is, I'm, we're giving people money to militate against the fear yeah. no, no, that I the get system the runs office. out of yeah. money. Yeah. And then once everybody says, well, they've got money, you've got money, it all calms down and you don't have unnecessary bankruptcies, which are driven by temporary shortfalls yeah. of yeah. cash flow, yeah. which is exactly what's happening yeah. and exactly what will happen. The interesting thing, John, about human nature, and I've always found this, is, is that we have educated ourselves to think that easy solutions must have a flaw and that the solution to a complicated thing like a monetary problem has to be really highfalutin and difficult. But it doesn't. Sure, no, no, that's... Uh, and, and really intelligent humans really don't like easy things. Mm -mm. They don't like things that people some like... Some of the best ideas in the world are the, the simplest. Look, I've always thought in economics, what is important is rarely complicated. And what is complicated is rarely yeah. important. Yeah. And this is one of those moments where we say, hold on a second, what is the job of economic authorities right now? It is to understand the anxiety of the people and do something about it. The anxiety of the people right now is coronavirus. The anxiety of the people very soon is going to be my livelihood. Can I stay afloat? And the job of the authorities is to understand those anxieties and do something about it the most effective, the easiest way. And the easiest way to do this is for the central bank to understand we are facing a deflationary shock and that deflationary shock has got the attendant downside of hoarding money and then good companies will go bust. So what do we do? 
yeah, you can do QE and you can work for the banks and you can do this, that and the other, but most people never, ever see the proceeds of QE. Yeah, you can say, we're going to suspend VAT and then you do a VAT return. La, la, la. That's, again, a cumbersome way of doing the same thing. This is a simple way. You don't even print the money anymore. You just simply add zero to someone's account. Ooh, I like the zero. Or two, maybe. <laughs> John. <laughs> two for me, one for you. But this is, when we said, John, let's go back to that. This crisis is going to change the way we think about the world. Everything changes. Public health, private health, the role of the state. You know, the fact now that our frontline people are nurses and medics and paramedics and people who are striving to live in this country, right? They are our heroes. It changes the world completely. So it's no longer the big celebrities. It's no longer this thing. You know, we're looking down. We're looking at people, normal people, who are going to save us. Mm. That changes the way in which we do public-private things. It changes the way in which we value individualism. It changes the way in which we think. And at the root cause is this fragility. Now, this is why I think, for example, why we're a bit concerned about what the Brits are doing yeah. with this herd immunity because it seems to be putting at risk a greater amount of ordinary people in order to satisfy an idea that in five or six months' time we'll have more immune people. So what it's doing, it's, it's pushing the problem out, and it seems to be irresponsible. And I think the visceral reaction against that is, at a moment like now, people want protection. They want somebody to say, I'll look after you. I've got your back, yeah. I've got your back. And the central bank of a country is one such institution. And if they don't step up and lead, the recession will be much, much more calamitous than it needs to be. But in order to get to that place where you fix things, you've got to realize that the ideas that you thought were germane five weeks ago, five days ago, are no longer germane. And you've got to rethink everything, including the way in which you look at the monetary system. Yeah, but hang on a second, Mac. The, the other question I want to ask you is, I always thought that because we're part of the Eurozone, that we don't print our money anymore. So we can't do that this unilaterally. Is, this is the big flaw. Uh, we do print our money. This is the big flaw in understanding about the ECB. Okay. The Irish Central Bank has total control over the amount of money printed in Ireland. What it doesn't have control over is the rate of interest or the rate of exchange right? The right. euro dollar rate. So the central bank has complete autonomy over what it does here. And, which is why, for example, if you look at the euros in your pocket, there are Irish euros and German euros. And they sure. look different, right? Yeah. You know that the serial number of the notes even are different. So you can identify as a German or an Irish euro. In the same way as central banks in all sorts of regions print their own stuff, we in Ireland have total autonomy, which is why in the crash, the, Euro, the ECB didn't help us. Remember? Yeah, They wash their hands of us, which is why Lagarde says we're not going to help the Italians, right? We can print our own money, but the most interesting thing here is I believe this is a worldwide solution. This is not just Ireland. This is the way we have to migrate towards it. The Irish authorities in the central bank, I was about to say in Dame Street where I used to work, but they're now in some swanky pants thing yeah, down yeah. by Google, right? Yeah, they been there can, many times. They actually. can do exactly what they want. Now, if, for example, so for example, the money supply in Ireland is about 250 billion euros is floating around out there. Okay. If they decided, okay, what we don't want to do is inject too much money, you could inject maybe 20 billion people's pockets, okay? You could take out 20 billion from somewhere else. It's called open market operations. It's the way in which a central bank controls the money supply of a right. country. It's all extremely doable. And if you wanted to say, well, you know what? We don't particularly want to expand the money supply. What you would do, you would target the money into people's accounts and then take out some idle money that's sitting on the banks doing nothing. So it's all... What the hell is idle money? There's loads of idle money. There's loads and loads of reserves, deposits in banks that are doing nothing. Doing nothing. People's deposits. Right? Right. So if you're not borrowing my deposits, right? Yeah, yeah, no. That I, money's just sitting there doing nothing. I thought that was reinvested into... No, it's not. No, it's not. This is all the alchemy of... John, this is... This is, Listen, I this really is monetary need to know. economics 101, right? 
But in actual fact, you could I be, really need to bone up in economics. No, you don't, John. You see, you'd be you'd be amazed at the amount of economists who don't know this, who've never studied monetary economics, who've never worked in central banks, right? Who don't know this that what you have, the central bank can go in and do whatever it wants. What I'm saying is targeted drops of money called helicopter money into people's accounts and businesses' accounts will have a profound impact on the economy. And if you're worried about the rate of interest or whatever, you just want to do what these call these open market operations every day in the market. It can be all done. It needs courage and vision and leadership from the central bank. That's the problem. What is absent in economics, not ideas, it's the courage to execute ideas. First of all, the live show was supposed to be this week or last weekend. Didn't go ahead. Uh, bear with us. We're going to come back and see how we go. We're we, hugely disappointed on that. God, I was I was actually really looking forward to that. But we'll have a brilliant one. Yeah. Hopefully May, June, whatever, whenever this thing passes, whenever whenever the, the guys who know about this say, you know what, it's safe to go back out and congregate, we will be back to you. And there with, won't be a mention of COVID-19. Not in. at all. Not at all. But we'll be back to you. So bear with us on that. Regarding everything else, normally we sign off kind of upbeat, and I think we are both upbeat, but, you know, what would you say, John? Just take care. and Absolutely. And I, one thing that has always struck me and it struck me even more now, do you remember I brought you the sound of Wuhan mm -hmm. um, last week? Well, music is a brilliant uplifter. And that has come to the fore in Italy when they're out singing on the streets from their apartments in Siena and Rome and Florence. Have a listen to some of these. And if this doesn't give you a little bit of an uplift and restore your faith in humanity. And by the way, can I just end on those lovely operatic pieces from Italy? If you have ever heard John Davis singing, <laughs> it is like the screech of an Jeez, alley cat. Come on, screech of an alley cat. So listen, have the crack. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>